As King David neared his death, he named his son Solomon as heir to the throne. The Lord blessed Solomon and established him as a wise and prosperous ruler. King Solomon built a temple and dedicated it to the Lord. The Lord accepted the temple as a place where he could dwell among his people, if they remained faithful to him. In Solomon's later years, he disobeyed the Lord's commandments by marrying many wives outside the covenant. Some of Solomon's wives encouraged him to worship idols and turn his heart away from the Lord. After the death of Solomon, his son Rehoboam decided to increase the people's burdens. The people revolted and were divided into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Jeroboam, king of the northern kingdom, introduced idolatry and other wicked practices among his people. Subsequent kings in Israel and Judah drifted further into wickedness. Because King Ahab and his wife Jezebel established the worship of Baal throughout the northern kingdom, the prophet Elijah sealed the heavens, causing years of drought. The Lord preserved Elijah and eventually led him to a widow in Zarephath, who fed him for many days. Elijah raised the widow's son from the dead. The prophet Elijah called the children of Israel to repent. To show the people that the God of Israel was the only true God, Elijah challenged the priests of Baal to a contest. Elijah prevailed in the contest and then opened the heavens to rain. When Jezebel sought Elijah's life, he fled. The Lord comforted Elijah and showed him there were seven thousand who were faithful to the Lord. At the beginning of his reign, Solomon loved the God of Israel and covenanted with God that he would walk in obedience throughout his administration as king of Israel. Solomon was promised wisdom, riches, honor, and long life if he would continue in righteousness before the Lord. The promise was fulfilled. During his life, Solomon became famous for his wisdom. Great men and women from many nations came to hear him and test his understanding and knowledge. Solomon also acquired great wealth and there were said to be no kings in all the earth who could compare to him. Under Solomon's reign Israel reached her greatest point as a nation honor, wealth, power, and respect were hers because of the administration of her greatest king. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give thee. Before King Solomon replied, he reflected on what was his greatest need. Was it power and influence? Was it wealth and riches? Was it fame and glory? Let us ponder carefully Solomon's answer. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much, and largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. Did not the Savior say, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven? Yes, the challenge to each one of us in these days of deceit and discord is to be innocent, to be guileless. Secondly, humility. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. We live in a world where men have largely turned away from righteousness and are self-seeking, gratifying pride and vain ambition. We have the challenge to humble ourselves before God and become, in King Benjamin's words, as a child, submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love, willing to submit to all things which the Lord seeth fit to inflict upon us, even as a child doth submit to his father. Thirdly, simplicity. A child is uncomplicated and expresses himself without becoming devious. 
Yes, we need to strive for the simplicity of a child and raise our own children to have simple, unshakable testimonies of Jesus Christ. Then they will not fall prey to those temptations which would divert them from the straight and narrow way. Fourthly, faith. Oh, for the faith of a child to dream the impossible dream and reach the unreachable star as our beloved President Kimball has challenged us to do. His mighty faith has removed many mountains. His childlike faith has brought forth many miracles. The fifth childlike quality is love, unquestioning love, freely given. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Sixthly, then, we need to acquire wisdom, that which Solomon desired, so that he could make righteous judgments. Many of us are not wise, for we are blinded by the material world around us. Wisdom comes from a realization of true values and priorities. It is a spiritual quality, for it is founded on discernment and an understanding heart. Great is the wisdom of the prophets, and all who heed them are blessed. The Lord has counseled us to seek not for riches, but for wisdom. The seventh quality I shall refer to is leadership. Not only leadership in the church, but of every honorable kind. Our sons, our daughters are his spirit children, whom he expects to us to love and cherish, teach and lead. Accountability. It is not being accountable that brings maturity. It is realizing that we are accountable, acting accordingly and being prepared to give an accounting to those in authority over us and eventually to the Lord himself. Ninthly, we will consider dependability. We need to warn and teach, protect and safeguard so that our little ones are not led away either physically or spiritually. There are so many voices, so many doctrines which are not of the Lord. Add to the tenth quality, that of self-mastery. The Nephite prophet Alma counseled, See that ye bridle all your passions, that you may be filled with love. If we will cling to our values, if we will build on our inheritance, if we will walk in obedience before the Lord, if we will simply live the gospel, we will be blessed in a magnificent and wonderful way. We will be looked upon as a peculiar people who found the key to a peculiar happiness. It seems as if the whole world has become obsessed with sex. In a very beguiling and alluring way, it is thrown at you constantly. You're exposed to it on television, in magazines and books, in videos, even in music. Turn your back on it. Shun it. I know that is easy to say and difficult to do. But each time that you do so, it will be so much the easier the next time. What a wonderful thing it will be if someday you can stand before the Lord and say, I am clean. One of Satan's clever tactics is to tempt us to concentrate on the present and ignore the future. Sin will always, always result in suffering. It may come sooner or it may come later, but it will come. The scripture states that you will stand with shame an awful guilt before the bar of God, and that you will experience a lively sense of guilt and pain and anguish. Now, the ancient King Solomon was one of the most outwardly successful human beings in history. He seemed to have everything, money, power, adoration, honor, but after decades of self-indulgence and luxury, 
How did King Solomon sum up his life? All is vanity, he said. This man who had it all ended up disillusioned, pessimistic, and unhappy despite everything he had going for him. There's a word in German, Weltschmerz, loosely defined it means a sadness that comes from brooding about how the world is inferior to how we think it ought to be. Perhaps there's a little Weltschmerz in all of us. When silent sorrows creep into the corners of our lives, when sadness saturates our days and casts deep shadows over our nights, when tragedy and injustice enter the world around us, including the lives of those we love, when we journey through our own personal and lonely path of misfortune and pain darkens our stillness, and breaches our tranquility, we might be tempted to agree with Solomon that life is vain and devoid of meaning. The good news is there is hope. There is a solution to the emptiness, vanity, and Weltschmerz of life. There is a solution to even the deepest hopelessness and discouragement you might feel. This hope is found in the transformative power of the gospel of Jesus Christ and in the Savior's redemptive power to heal us from our soul sickness. I am come, Jesus declared, that they might have life. And they might have it more abundantly. We achieve that abundant life not by focusing on our own needs, or on our own achievements, but by becoming true disciples of Jesus Christ, by following in his ways and engaging in his work. We find the abundant life by forgetting ourselves and engaging in the great cause of Christ. On December 26, 2004, a powerful earthquake struck the coast of Indonesia, creating a deadly tsunami that killed more than 200,000 people. It was a terrible tragedy. In one day, millions of lives were forever changed. But there was one group of people, although their village was destroyed, did not suffer a single casualty. The reason? They knew an Asami was coming. The Mokan people live, live in vi villages on the coast of Thailand and Burma, a society of fishermen. Their lives depend on the sea. For hundreds and perhaps thousands of years, their ancestors have studied the ocean, and they have passed their knowledge down from father to son. One thing in particular they were careful to teach was what to do when the ocean receded. According to their traditions, when that happened, the laboon, a wave that each people would soon arrive, arrive soon uh, later. When the elders of the village saw the dreaded signs, they shouted to everyone to run to high ground. Not everyone listened. One elderly fisherman said, none of the kids believed me. In fact, his own daughter called him a liar. But the old fisherman would not relent until all had left the village and climbed to a higher ground. The Mokan people were fortunate in that they had someone with conviction and warned them of what would follow. The villagers were fortunate because they listened. Had they not, they may have perished. The prophet Nephi wrote about the great disaster of his day, the destruction of Jerusalem. As one generation hath been destroyed among the Jews because of iniquity, he said, even so have they been destroyed from generation to generation according to their iniquities, and never hath any of them been destroyed, save it were foretold by the prophets of the Lord. Since the days of Adam, the Lord has spoken to his prophets, and while his message differs according 
to specific needs of the time, there is one consistent, never-changing theme. Depart from iniquity and journey to higher ground. As people heed the words of the prophets, the Lord blesses them. When they disregard His word, however, distress and suffering often follow. In our day, we face a similar choice. We can foolishly ignore the prophets of God, depend on our own strength, and ultimately reap the consequences, or we can wisely draw near to the Lord and partake of His blessings. Consequently, our journey to higher ground must include the house of the Lord. As we come unto Christ and journey to higher ground, we will desire to spend more time in His temples because the temples represent higher ground, sacred ground. In every age, we are faced with a choice. We can trust in our own strength or we can journey to higher ground and come unto Christ. Each choice has a consequence each consequence a destination. Elijah sealed the heavens against rain by priesthood power. Elder Joseph Fielding Smith found a special significance in verse 1. The first appearance of Elijah we read of is in the 17th chapter of 1 Kings, when he came before the king and said, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. There is something very significant in that edict. I want you to get it. Follow me again closely, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. The reason I put emphasis upon this is to impress you with the sealing power by which Elijah was able to close the heavens, that there should be no rain or dew until he spoke. I think this is a good time to talk about the difference between priesthood authority and priesthood power. All who hold the priesthood are authorized, they have the authority to act for the Lord, and this applies in the ordinances that are performed under the direction of the, the church and the priesthood keys. But priesthood power is more than priesthood authority. And in the various exercises of our priesthood in the family, we need priesthood power. And priesthood power depends upon personal righteousness. In the Book of Mormon, to really uh, speak to that excellent principle, in the uh, third book of Nephi, chapter 8, verse 1, and there was not any man who could do a miracle in the name of Jesus save he were cleansed every whit from his iniquity. Speaking to the sacred responsibility we have in connection of purifying ourselves, that yes. we may be worthy to use the priesthood for the benefit of our family. And speaking of the essential nature of personal righteousness and obedience to the commandments to have priesthood power. Uh, Elder Wilford Woodruff taught, the nearer we live to God, the closer we obey His laws and keep His commandments, the more priesthood power we will have. Who is the prophet Elijah who is to come before the great and dreadful day of the Lord? Let me review some of the highlights of his life. The first mention of Elijah in the record refers to him as being from Tishbe of Gilead, east of Jordan, in the area of Galilee. The events with which he was associated occurred in the ninth century before the birth of Christ. This great prophet was one of the leaders in defending Jehovah as the true God of Israel against those who were advancing Baal worship. His life is associated with many miracles. Elijah prophesied to King, to King Ahab that there would be a drought, and a drought did come to the land. The prophet went to the east of Jordan by the brook Cherith. The brook provided him with water, and the Lord caused him to be fed by ravens morning and night. Because of the drought, the brook dried up, and he sought another refuge. The Lord directed him to a poor widow who lived with her only son.
Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake. But an handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering sticks, that I may dress it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. Fear not. Go, and do as thou hast said. But make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me. And after, make for thee and for thy son. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, The barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruse of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And it did sustain them through the long drought. During this time, the widow's son became ill and died, or was close to death. Elijah called upon the Lord, and the boy began to breathe again and was given life. Later, the Lord appeared to Elijah and told him to go to King Ahab, and the drought would be broken. Ahab married Jezebel, the daughter of the king of Tyre, where uh, the god Baal was worshipped. Elijah charged Ab uh, 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 Ahab with forsaking the commandments of the Lord and following Baal. He challenged the prophets of Baal, supported by Jezebel, to come to Mount Carmel and determine whether God or Baal was God, or the Lord or Baal was God. Then the fire from the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. The heavens turned black with clouds and with wind, and the torrential rains came and ended the drought. Jezebel became angry and threatened Elijah, and he fled south to Beersheba and into the wilderness of Sinai. It must have been very lonely for Elijah during this period. Men were seeking his life, he felt himself to be the only faithful prophet left in Israel, and he was hiding in a cave. President Joseph Fielding Smith wrote, when he was there, the Lord called upon him and asked him what he was doing there, and in his sorrow, because of the hardness of the hearts of the people, he told the Lord the condition, that he alone remained, that they sought his life to take it away. But the Lord showed him that there were others who had remained true unto him, even seven thousand. To one who thought that revelation would flow without effort, the Lord said, You have not understood. You have supposed that I would give it unto you when you took no thought, save it were to ask me. But behold, I say unto you that you must study it out in your mind. Then you must ask me if it be right. And if it is right, I will cause that your bosom shall burn within you. Therefore, you shall feel that it is right. This burning in the bosom is not purely a physical sensation. It is more like a warm light shining within your being, describing the promptings from the Holy Ghost to one who has not had them is very difficult. Such promptings are personal and strictly private. The Holy Ghost speaks with a voice that you feel more than you hear. It is described as a still, small voice. And while we speak of listening to the whisperings of the Spirit, most often one describes a spiritual prompting by saying, I had a feeling. 
The prophet Joseph Smith explained, a person may profit by noticing the first intimations of the spirit of revelation. For instance, when you feel pure intelligence flowing into you, it may give you sudden strokes of ideas so that by noticing it, you may find it fulfilled the same day or soon. Those things that were presented unto your mind by the Spirit of God will come to pass, and thus by learning the Spirit of God and understanding it, you may grow into the principle of revelation until you become perfect in Christ Jesus. It is the Spirit which will bear a record to your heart as you read the Scriptures, as you hear the Lord's authorized servants, and as God speaks directly to your heart. You can listen and hear if you believe the scriptures are accurate when they describe the Holy Ghost this way. Yea, thus saith the still small voice, which whispereth through and pierceth all things, and oftentimes it maketh my bones to quake when it maketh manifest. Now I testify that it is a small voice. It whispers, not shouts. And so you must be very quiet inside. That is why you may wisely fast when you want to listen. And that is why you will listen best when you feel, Father, thy will, not mine, be done. A feeling, I want only what you want. Then the still, small voice, will seem as if it pierces you. It may make your bones to quake. More often, it will make your heart burn within you, again softly, but with a burning which will lift and reassure. The information in this presentation is taken from the Old Testament lesson material for various church classes and videos, all provided by The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Salt Lake City, Utah, unless otherwise noted.